All right, hi everybody. So this is the mad week of getting ready um, and starting to stream. Partially I've been uh, doing so many videos this week <clears throat> on one level to get comfortable talking into a camera and also like understanding that there's people behind it. And also just getting used to the technology and seeing how things work. And so um, we had a really successful fundraiser this week, the other presentations we did, plus um, just people who have been following the project for a long time um, all came together and we are funded through really through April. So I'm absolutely grateful for everybody's support who has been helping. You know, we had to spend a little bit more time on fundraising than I ever like. Um, I guess just sort of like any pledge week. And uh, now we get to focus on what's really coming up, which is um, building our website, communicating with others, and specifically actively getting 2,000 chestnuts that are currently in my nursery taken care of, finding homes for them in the Pacific Northwest, transferring those trees, and uh, doing the work of getting people excited about having chestnuts over the next several years. Um, please feel free to um, you know, follow us and subscribe. If you're looking at this in the future, right now we can't subscribe, but we should be able to starting tomorrow. And uh, that's a way for us to have ongoing content and to know that streaming is a valid way to participate with our larger community. Um, I'm trying out a lot of different kinds of social media and technologies. So seeing people respond to Twitch is part of why I know that this is going to be a useful uh, space. My hopes for the future include things like actually leading some classes and workshops. Um, we could be doing sort of a permaculture design course curriculum with some added features. We could be focusing on the chestnut cycle itself or other soil building methods. Um, and maybe we'll even have some Zoom interviews with uh, people who are connected uh, and inspiring to the project that can help you know, move things forward. Um, so in order to meet Twitch's requirements, um, I need to be streaming for about another hour or two. I think I'm gonna do an hour and a half. And I had a lot of fun about, oh, new follower, thank you so much. I had a lot of fun um, a couple of days ago going through some of the Twitter uh, threads that I've written over the years. And uh, they end up being almost like little slide decks. So good spot to have some conversation. So I figured we'd go through a couple of those and see how that felt. Um, anybody who's following and in the chat, please participate, ask questions. I, I can see the chat, so I will be um, responding to it. And uh, let's see this as a casual conversation rather than a formal presentation. Um, oh, I'm Jordan Fink, and I'm the executive director of Build Soil, if you're joining us for the first time. And we're a new newish nonprofit that started on Twitter and has been growing that's focused on community solutions to climate change and helping people self-organize with themselves with their friends and neighbors and build community around um, actions that move the climate forward the way we want and specifically we're starting with an effort to plant 1 million edible chestnuts all over the world for a number of reasons and i'm gonna have to make a video focused very focused on like the reasons of why chestnuts we'll get there so just to see how many people are in the chat because it's always fun oh we've got um five people Oh, six people. You're all very welcome. Thank you so much for being here. All right, I'm going to switch us over to internet mode. Oh, it's not showing. I'm still, excuse me for a technical moment. There we go. So this is one of my favorite threads on river restoration, which is something that I don't see that much discussion about uh, when we talk about climate issues and when we talk about like projections into the future and issues. Um, my first introduction to river restoration comes from the fact that I grew up in the Pacific Northwest where uh, we have an endangered species that is vital, a keystone species to the region. Um, where I come from, the Pacific salmon are this massive influx of protein and nutrients and nitrogen from the ocean, phos uh, phosphorus too. And um, they go out as tiny little minnows, little, little babies, little fingerlings, and they go out and they live for seven or so years out into the ocean and they grow huge and they fight their ways back to the river that they're from and then spawn and lay eggs and deliver massive amounts of sea nutrients back to land. We've been able to correlate 
uh, the size of tree rings in the forest to the size of salmon runs, which means through the distribution network of birds and bears and all the animals that come and eat the salmon and then bring it back out to the forest, there's this injection of protein into the ecosystem. And uh, it makes it makes a huge difference. Um, a friend of mine once did the calculations and figured out that just literally the amount of like board feet of timber that gets produced and that gets lost because of the loss of the Pacific salmon runs, um, it outweighs any other factors. We really should be making sure that our ecosystem has its primary form of connection to the ocean and it's like only form of nutrients that comes up from the ocean up the rivers along with uh, lamprey which are also a significant in influx of ocean nutrients so salmon restoration in the pacific northwest has always been a big issue and there's been all of this um, environmental species money that has funded river restoration and so the conversation is is ongoing in the pacific northwest how to design rivers what's the proper way of approaching them how do you balance the function of a river with all the other functions that we need to have in the landscape um, and so I got a graduate certificate years ago in river restoration taught by the brilliant uh, Dr. Janine Castro who's with Fish and Wildlife and is a fluvial geomorphologist, which means that she studies the way that rivers interact with the shaping and the structure of landscapes. And so just having that lens really influenced me at a young age about thinking about river processes, not just as this one little zone on the land, but literally the one way of looking at the entire landscape's function, process, form, as well as the relationship with ecology and the relationship with climate, the relationship with uh, soils, like all these things interplay. And rivers are this amazing narrative for seeing how they interlock with each other. So, oh, there's some people here. I'm sorry, is it a little quiet? I can definitely turn up the stream. Um, am I talking too soft or do I need to actually bring the volume up a little bit? How's that? Is that a little bit better? Give me feedback. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the chat right now. Are you able to hear me? A little more. I'm wondering if my mic is having problems because that is actually the full volume. Is that a little bit better? See, this is why I'm doing these things early so that there's all these technical difficulties get taken care of. Let me actually look at the settings really quick and make sure that I'm on the correct microphone. Okay, as far as I know, this is the correct microphone. I don't know if I can get any higher volume is it me? Am I not talking loud enough? <laughs> okay, so we, we all, we have a, a range of, of experiences right now that are happening. Um, if I'm mumbling too much, please shout and I'll, I'll get back to it. So I was talking about river process and the importance for understanding um, all these other factors. Having that lens of river process um, is really important because it affects the way that I look at landscapes. When I'm going to like a piece of land and somebody's saying, can you please tell me what's happening here? Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, the first, one of the first things that I do is I, I find the river and I've heard when I've said this to people, they've said, uh, well, this piece of land doesn't have a stream or a river. And I'm like, it does because at some point there's a low point and maybe it's off of the property. But eventually there's a spot where the water converges and starts to reach the surface or reaches the surface for part of the year. And so I always go down there and see what's happening with that, with that um, river, right? So um, understanding those processes can help you understand what's going on in the dynamics of the place over time. It gives you a snapshot into where things are headed and where they've been um, and where potential threats to the landscape are as well. So I'm just going to go through this uh, thread and we can we can see what, where I jump off from that. Okay, river restoration is essential climate action. Never gets proper attention. It's a driver of soil loss and ecosystem change that will be our undoing if we don't address it in our efforts. Stream incision can't be ignored. So here's some pictures I pulled up. And this is just showing a straight river it's been straightened and over time its processes as it moves. And this looks like it's a river restoration diagram. 
So it's actually somebody installing this. They've, they've cut the river to give it more sinuosity. That sinuosity is that curve, how sinuous it is. And then they've revegetated it. And now here's healthy processes happening. And uh, here's an example of what's called incision, where a river has begun to cut deeper into its channel. So that means that there's a cutting that's going back further and further. And over time, this cut is going to move back following my mouse. Hey there, we're talking about river process today, kid. So this uh, channel is being cut back over time and we can talk about why that happens and what some of the dynamics are, but this is a big threat because this is a huge amount of soil um, and landscape that's in the way. And as river processes move, they move from the surface and this drops the river. So the river over time is dropping back and back. And at the same time, the river represents the top surface of where the water table is. So the water table in this spot is dropping right now. Maybe it's a little bit below the surface as it's maintaining this process right here. But this is actually a demonstration that all over the landscape, up upslope from the river, right here and right here, you're actually having a dropping water table at the same time because the river represents a drain and its height is a regulatory height for the water table. Yeah, and here's an example of, ooh, things are very slow right now on this computer. I'm still getting my tech together. So here's an example of uh, the water table and here's the stream itself. And the stream is just a little bit below the water table. You know, there's, as the water drains down it, this is where all the landscape and the water goes into it. And so when there's an incision, often caused by increased runoff, and we'll talk about those processes, which are often caused by what's called flashier storms, right? So you get more storm material or you get more water at a time that gives more energy, which allows that, um, that channel to get cut deeper and then it begins to drain the water table away. All right, so first off in this thread, hey, fluvial geomorphologist, this is meant to be a very simplified version of things. Um, it's starting, it's a starting place for better centering your work in the discussion of climate change. And I just want to say that because, um, you know, like I've have my six week graduate certificate in this stuff, but that's not the same thing at all as somebody who's spent um, their lifetime developing a deep understanding and appreciation of the dynamics. And so it's always possible and likely that this all is an oversimplification. Here's a beautiful image of but what they've done here is they've taken LIDAR, which is laser photography of the shape of land. And you can see here that while there's a main channel for the river, over time it has moved. And these are past channels. As the river's moved over time, it's braided. And sometimes these channels are um, happening simultaneously, especially in braided streams. But also this represents this channel moving over time, bending, folding, leaving oxbows. And part of this is because this is a dynamic process. Water is moving down this way and sediment is also, wait, wait, that's backwards. Water is moving this way uh, up and sediment is also moving up. And at the same time, seeds and other kinds of biological matter are moving and changing too. Over time, sediment is moving here and here and here through gravel bars, maybe one to the next year by year. And this channel is a process, the movement of sediment and water and seeds. And so this is a dynamic system. And if you watch this over time, it would almost be like, um, you know, kids with jump ropes where the wave moves. So this curving wave is moving over time, like energy pulses. So let's start by talking about some of the zones in the landscape that relate to rivers. The river has a channel, beside it is the floodplain. Above that are the uplands. The water in the river is only visible part of the entire water draining through the landscape above. So there's an example of a stream channel, an upland area and a transitional fringe next to it, and then the floodplain. Now different river systems and landscapes look different and floodplains can be much larger, they can be much smaller. And it's likely that looking at the processes of this landscape, this is an example of at some point in the near or far past, 
um, a river that was more towards the surface and spread out during its floods onto this entire landscape has dropped due to incision, often caused by things like large scale climate change or changes in the hydrology or changes in the weather patterns. And it has restabilized at this height. And here's another example of another part of the river. So here's, in this case, this is all floodplain. There's no, uh, there's no showing of a difference here. The water table is underground until it comes to the surface. There's an exchange between the groundwater and the river channel so that the pebbles at the bottom of the channel are here, but underneath is actually a zone of exchange. And this is the area that salmon are trying to get into because there's an uplifting of oxygen and a mixing of water in this area. So salmon are digging into the gravels and they're building their nests down here in order to make sure that their um, their babies have accurate, or not accurate, have, have a, enough uh, oxygen coming through at all times and can be regulating things like temperature. This also ends up being a much colder zone in rivers, especially when rivers are exposed to the sun because the groundwater is able to you know introduce cool water into the river, which is an essential measurement of river health. Uh, rivers and streams are fascinating systems, and I do recommend reading and learning about them. I'm focusing on this one part, but a favorite writer on this topic, if you're interested, is Luna Leopold. He was the son of Aldo Leopold, the uh, famous person who wrote the Sand Co County Almanac. Well, his son was one of the most important like early people in river science, and uh, famously, as a small child, he was uh, in the in the woods with his father, and he couldn't pronounce the word ripple when he was describing the structure of a river where there's the zones that are sort of pebbly and have ripples and white water and then move into cool pools, dark, you know, still pools as the river moves. And so that actually became the technical term in their family and then has become the technical term in all river science that we call it a riffle. So here's Aldo. Oh, sorry, this is Luna. This is Luna Leopold. And I recommend reading his stuff. It's brilliant. And I think that that's Aldo, actually. But it's hard to know because the foundation has pictures of both of them. That might be... Lu no, no. So there's Luna. Water is the most critical resource issue of our lifetime and our children's lifetime. The health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. And one of his many books, and this is probably his most popularly like accessible, It's most, a lot of his other stuff are engineering books, so they're just like charts and diagrams. But a view of the river really is an essential read. If you want to understand rivers, their importance, and um, the fact that they are really like this um, node in understanding all sorts of landscape and geo, geo um, ecological concepts. Oh, we now have a bunch of people here. Thanks everybody for coming. I'm Jordan with Build Soil, and we're talking about river processes today. Feel free to use the chat and uh, talk, and uh, I'll try to answer questions. All right. So wading in. One way to think about rivers is that they are not just water. They are a system that moves water, sediment from silt, all the way from silt to boulders, and also seeds, which then colonize and hold on to material and can actually allow for some interesting uh, connections in the stream pattern. So um, let's just look at the pictures first. Here's a river moving water, clearly. Maybe some sediment here coming off the banks. And rivers are sized. Usually they've moved everything that they can move too much. And there's little bits of movement happening on the, on the ground. The little particles are moving. The big, bigger particles are moving during bigger events. Some of these are not moving very much at all. Here in the Pacific Northwest, where our landscape was largely defined by catastrophic floods, we have rocks that are so large that they're outsized for any river, and rivers tend to not move them even during large events. Um, so when you see a gigantic, what we call them erratics, huge boulders. Um, so looking at, 
And also the other thing to think about is that um, over time rivers pattern themselves and they start to create almost like a roof tile pattern on the bottom of the rocks, which stops the rocks from moving as much too, so they can get stable. One reason not to be moving rocks around too much when you're um, hiking in the forest. So in the water itself is what's called a dissolved and the suspended load. The dissolved load is just like the stuff that dissolves. You know, if you took that water and kept it, maybe it'd have a tiny bit of salts to it. It would have a little bit of mineral component. Um, but it, some of it would also like eventually settle to the bottom. And that's like the suspended load, right? And then on the bed itself, there's rocks that are being moved over time, you know, that are actually like being picked up and moved. And then there's um, pebbles. Well, those are pebbles. And there's larger rocks that are just sort of being like, moved slowly you know rolled over time and there's this dynamic process happening of that pioneer vegetation on the gravel bars so in a river system you have the river and gravel is being moved slowly over time and it's being stored in gravel bars at large rain events it's being picked up and moved all at once and then most of the time there's less water in the river and so they stay still. So when you're down fly fishing on the edge of the river and you see a gravel bar and there's no vegetation on it, that's material that's probably been moved in the last year or two. You could even um, stain all those rocks and notice that those rocks are showing up, you know, just the next gravel bar down the next year or the gravel bar after that the next year. So there's a almost like systematic movement of material happening, but Seeds change the dynamics of rivers, and when they have an opportunity to, they colonize, settle, and they begin to uh, put in their roots, and they begin to stabilize, and they can change the dynamics of rivers. They can turn what normally would be a dynamic gravel bar into an island or a section of the floodplain that is going to take an extremely large event to be able to like move that material. So can't forget seeds and plants in their relationship with all of this. And a lot of plants in rivers have evolved to be able to handle these kinds of situations. So we have plants like willows or um, red osier dogwood or dogwoods in general um, or cottonwoods, um, poplar. And what they all can do is you can just literally take one of those trees and bury it in soil and gravel and it'll still be able to sprout even from its top branches, or it'll break apart and just, you know, you put a stick of a willow in the side of a river and it's going to turn into a tree because they have rooting hormones that feed microbes in the soil and also act as, um, as sort of like the ability to take a part of themselves and regenerate quickly. So rivers and these plants that have the capacity to interact very well with aquatic microbes, as well as regrow from small parts of their body, like that, that goes hand in hand. All right. Um, anybody have any thoughts or questions about that before I move on? Because I can just keep going. Nope. Okay. So one thing to remember is that water holds solar energy. We don't tend to think about the fact that one of the largest storages of solar energy is clean and elevated water. Sunlight comes to the ocean, takes this salty water that's already done the work of dissolving minerals and is at the lowest gravitational place that it can be. And it adds heat and that allows it to rise up high and it cleans the water so that it can do chemical work again. Most, when you uh, take organic chemistry or when you like study biological processes, there's always these aqueous solutions or aqueous equations, right? There's these things that require water in order to happen. And one of the many reasons for that is that water itself, when it's clean, it drives reactions. It actually has potential energy as it's kind of like wanting to chew on things chemically. And our bodies themselves use that chemical energy. It's why we have to drink, you know, clean water. One of the reasons. And because it actually does the work of, you know, taking out wastes and dissolving things that we need dissolved. So it has solar energy stored as chemical potential and physical potential energy. And that energy drives everything, right? So we have the oceans, we've got the sunlight lifting high into the atmosphere and it's coming down. It's coming down as ice and snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does make sense. So it's coming. So this is one of the main storages that we have of solar energy. So um, 
that solar energy then is dropped out and it becomes precipitation and becomes snow, which then becomes melt. And all of these contribute to stream flow. And that stream flow is full of energy, right? It has a volume and it has elevation and it has work that it can do. There's also fog and trees and flora and fauna and uptake this stuff. Trees are involved in a huge amount of holding water, grabbing water that normally would be water vapor. So it can, uh, so it condenses on the fractal surfaces of trees. And at the same time, it draws that water and lifts it back up in the form of uh, precipitation. We actually are able to look at when you do photosynthesis with water and when plants use water, it changes the isotope of, the, of I think it's the isotope of the oxygen. Um, and so we're able to actually look at rainfall and decide whether it's come directly from the ocean or whether it's come through a plant, lifting it through its stomata and making water vapor to make new clouds. Um, you may have heard that the Amazon rainforest makes its own precipitation. It grabs water and it turns it into rain and then it collects that rain as best as it can and lifts it over and over again. If you were to take out all of those trees, you wouldn't have nearly as much water moving through the system. And in terms of like solar energy, right? Like that's the reduction of huge amounts of energy that have been captured in entering the ecosystem and entering also the structural system that's holding rock high, that's holding landscapes high, that's, that's building soil, all those kinds of things. So um, as you go deeper and deeper into continents, when you're on the coast, you can see that most of the rainfall on the coast of a continent is coming from the ocean. It's just rainfall from the precipitation. But as you go deeper and deeper, you find more and more of its trees to the point where when you go into the center of continents on the other side of coastal mountains, you are getting most of your rainfall through the action of plants that are lifting and moving that water. And so even though the largest carbon storages and fastest carbon storages we have are often the uh, grasslands that form in the center of continents, the water that is supporting those grasslands is coming from the coastal you know, tree forests, the conifers, the gigantic trees, the, the coastal forests that are there living off of the salmon that are coming up or the other kinds of fish and other kinds of like nutrients and the volcanic ash that's coming from the ranges themselves that is like powering the interiors of continents and to reduce the coastal forests is to actually reduce the capacity of the inner landscape to be able to be grasslands and it can shift to desert pretty quick and there's other ways that these landscapes can sh shift to desert so there's storage of fresh water there's evaporation there's still a lot of movement that's happening here but the energy in rivers can be described as steeper and deeper means more energy the slope of the landscape and the amount of water allow for work to be done so landscapes that are steeper have more like rise over run and they can they have um you know you can imagine a river that's really like shallow that it doesn't have enough as much energy that's being like enacted as the potential energy that's being released in a really like steep stream so that's where we get the energy like budget for the landscape from water. So then there's this order that happens with that energy. So the first priority is that it has to overcome its own attraction, right? Water is chemically attracted to itself and it creates little drops, right? It has surface tension and that's powerful. That's actually what allows it to be drawn up trees. It's allow you know, allows for all this sort of capillary stuff. Um, but it has to overcome its own attraction. That energy is used. The next level is that it has to overcome its own surface tension so it can flow. Because before that, it's solid, then it's drops, now it can move. Third, it allows to move sediment. So first, it's grabbing small things, right? It's grabbing silts, it's grabbing particles, it's grabbing dust. And over time, as it gets bigger and bigger, it's moving larger and larger sediments. Well, when it's able to move all the sediments and it still has excess energy from maybe too much water all at once, or a landscape that has um, a very like high rise to run, then that's when it, it's hungry and it needs to start moving things, right? So it starts grabbing the channels. Everywhere it can dig, it starts digging. If it's hit rock, it can't go much further, but it starts just wearing away at the rock over time. So erosion is this last process that happens after these other energy processes have happened. And this is an important uh, process to understand for being able to understand how landscapes work. 
I don't remember what this image is specifically about other than it's showing a lot of vegetation on banks. And some images of erosion. Sometimes I just use images that are sort of illustrating the general pattern of things. So here's erosion happening. So one way of expressing this is this idea called lanes balance. And what this is saying is that erosion and flooding are actually opposites. A river tries to balance its energy with its work. And if it doesn't have material to move in proportion to its slope, it'll have to adjust until things are balanced again. So here we go. Here's a, a scale. And on one side is, is erosion. The scale moves to degradation. The other side is aggradation, which is like the dropping of material. And at the same time, these are there's issues of sediment size and stream slope. The movement between being flat and steep, the movement between coarse materials and fine materials, the average pebble size in a river. And the river is always sort of like moving between those dynamics. If it has if it has a drop in energy, it drops material. If it has an increase in energy, it grabs material. And it's always trying to form a balance. Here we go. Lane's balance says that sediment discharge, meaning the amount of sediment moving through the system, and sediment grain size are tended to be balanced against the water discharge and the slope. So big concept, but but as you start to see how it plays out in landscapes, it becomes really interesting. Oop, sorry, I got out of the. Any questions while I'm getting back to the spot? Okay, so for example, slope can also be understood as rise over run, the rise of the landscape over a course of time or a course of distance. So a river may meander and curve until it has a slope that balances its energy. And this is like something to think about is that a river can modify its slope by becoming more sinuous. So if a river has to get from here to here, it has a certain amount of rise over run. You know, let's make an, an accelerated version of that. Let's say it's a, it's a two to three, right? So this river, that's a straight line, is moving from two feet up and it's moving three feet as it moves along. Well, one way that it can deal with its extra energy is that it can lower its slope. Well, you can't actually lower the slope of the landscape in that case, but you can make the river go back and forth. So that extra energy that it's hungry for because the slope is out of balance with the rest of its energy dynamics, that begins to help the river move. And so a river will begin to move its sin and become more sinuous directly in relationship with that need to balance those energies. And so sometimes when a river is in size, like you go to places in the Southwest, right? Where there's rivers that are like cut into the rock and they don't have anywhere to move. Those rivers are going to have a locked in slope. And that locked in slope means that they're much you know, their dynamics are going to be much different. They're going to have a lot of like whitewater rapids potentially and a lot of other kinds of processes going on. And if they have extra energy, they may just continue to dig deeper because they have no way to balance that energy by moving out. Oh, we have some new people. Thank you everybody for showing up. My name is Jordan, Build Soil here. And uh, we're talking about river processes today. Let's see what this picture is. This is just a citation. Meander scars and oxbow lakes and abandoned meanders in the broad flood plain of the uh, Rio Negro, Argentina. Okay. So rivers are shaped to balance water, sediment, and slope. One balance is holding capacity, and a healthy river is shaped so as to contain only the amount of water that keeps that balance. It won't erode the stream. Any more than that goes out into the floodplain where it slows and drops sediment. So this is a big deal. What constitutes a healthy river? So rivers have a channel like we talked about, and they have a floodplain where the water during high river events, high water events can go off. And then there's uplands above the floodplain. And that floodplain can be different sizes depending on like the shape of the channel and the larger landscape and whether the river's incised over time or not. But in a healthy, non-incised river, it is perfectly sized so that 
there is a spot called Bankful, which happens to be about a 2.5 reoccurring event, meaning on average every 2.5 years, there's a flood event that's just the right size. And there's a spot where any more water, it goes out onto the floodplain. And it turns out that that's exactly balanced with the erosive properties of the water. So that a balanced river um, can contain the water without eroding. And the moment it has too much water that would normally cause erosion, it can move out onto the floodplain and that extra water relaxes, drops sediment, adds nutrients, which often become the places where we try to farm. And it's a little bit like a bicycle that also has brakes on the side. So that extra energy is buffered and held by the vegetation and the rocks and also just the fact that water is being spread out over time. Um, sometimes that extra energy can be so much though that it can actually carve in and do erosion on the floodplain and carve even a new channel for the river. But a healthy river is going to have this balance most of the time. And at the same time there are those larger dynamic processes of the river migrating and moving and rippling and forming oxbows. Looks like my picture had the link attached. I guess that was so I could cite it. So here's a broad, relatively flat floodplain on a landscape. Flooding isn't always bad. And a lot of times we've built our homes right in flood landscapes. And uh, our approaches are often to um, build banks that are higher in order to channelize the river and get more water into the channel so that on large events, it's just in the river. And you might imagine that adds so much extra energy that it moves material and it starts to cut down deeper and deeper. So often we'll respond with things like we did with the LA River and, and pave the bottom of the river or you know put cement, put structures that sort of like try to grab that energy and, and you know like dissolve it, use it, turn it into heat. So here's a combination of low vegetated floodplain, exposed bars, gravel bars, and high flow channels provide this flood capacity, the ability of the landscape to handle flood. A high terrace bounds the floodplain. So this is the floodplain right here with gravels. Here's the river curving around. Here's vegetation a little higher holding onto things. And then here is a little bit of a terrace. So even during most flood events, the water only goes this far. And there may be reasons why this uh, terrace is formed. It could be that this used to be part of the floodplain and the river has incised and dropped. Or it might be that there's actually like a natural ridge right there or there's a change. Most landscapes in North America have three natural terraces and they correspond roughly with different climate regimes um, throughout the recent geo history, you know, like the last you know, several epochs. And so at different temperatures and different moisture levels, um, the regulation of the amount of energy actually moving from the ocean because of the heat of the earth has changed the amount of rainfall and the sea levels have been at different heights, which have also affected these things. And so that's meant that over time, natural landscape processes have been moved up and down the landscape and that terrace formation has happened at different times in different places. And geologists do a good job of being able to look at the land and tell you like, okay, this terrace structure was formed way back and this terrace structure is a little bit more recent. Um, multiple high flow channels provide flood relief for moderate floods. So here's a landscape where this whole area right here is just there as like the brakes on the bicycle wheel. You know, there it's, it's here and during high rain events that water can handle and fill as it moves down the landscape. Distributory channels convey flood flows on an alluvial fan. Image from, these are both the, uh, images from the Yakima. So in this case, we have a landscape which also has this sort of fanning structure, right? And as water is moving through it, it can fill and occupy all of those channels and it gets sort of like spread out and moved. Again, this pattern happens because it's the, it's the proper regulation pattern for balancing the energies that are moving through the system and the landscape itself. So how are we all doing? Is everybody doing okay over there? Feel, please feel free to use the chat and say hi and ask questions. Okay, rivers are shaped to where this is the one I already read. The floodplain takes care of the extra energy of a larger rain event. It absorbs and hydrates and fertilizes the landscape. It turns out that the regular size of a river's bank full is about a two year reoccurrence interval flood. 
So, big full stage, insipid flooding. It corresponds to the discharge, meaning the, the amount of water flow, at which a channel maintenance at which channel maintenance, like the maintenance of that structure, is the most effective. That is, the discharge at which moving sediment, forming or removing gravel bars, forming or changing bends and meanders, and generally doing work, results in the average morphologic characteristics of that river. This is from uh, Dunn and Leopold. So, like we were talking about before, this area from here to here, this is the topographic floodplain up to the top of these uh, basins. So this is like really big rain events, right? The hydrologic floodplain is the area that's constantly being influenced. Here's the channel of the river itself. And this depth right here is this bankful depth that every two years on average, an event happens. And that event, if it was any higher, moves onto the floodplain. And any lower, it's just regulating the processes of this river. And most of the time the river is small, you know, during non-rain events. Oh, okay, I think we've gathered enough tools and ideas to get into the big thing I want to discuss, incision. So here's a very incised situation, right? Like cut into the rock. There's a little ri there's a river way down here. First of all, the size of streams and rivers has been artificially... Oh, somebody just said this. Built my soil eight years ago, never went back. Good job. Oh, you even have stream... Oh, I guess this is a stream stream right now. <laughs> um, first, the size of streams and rivers has been artificially changed. In the Pacific Northwest, where I am, logs were forced down streams by temporary splash dams that scoured out rivers. So this is like a big deal here. So one of the things that happened during kind of like the first wave and second waves of logging was all this logging would happen high in the landscape. Nice. All this logging would happen high in the landscape and, you know, they wanted to get the logs down into the main rivers for transport as quick as possible. And so they did this by building temporary dams on the rivers and building up basically like a mini lake and then getting all of the logs in it. And then they would release the, the dam and the, the logs would you know, quickly flow down into the main river and this scoured out the landscape, right? Like that's a lot of material and it's a lot of water. And doing that over and over again in Oregon, in Washington, in California, um, there is probably not a river out there that has not dropped many feet, many meters uh, due to that history. And even the landscapes we think of as natural are restabilized uh, much lower than they were originally in the structure of the landscape has had to restabilize at a much lower. So huge amounts of erosion. And you gotta remember all of that soil, all of that vegetation, that hell holds huge amounts of carbon. So that material, that, that carbon in that soil, I mean, it's being maintained by, by organisms. It's being maintained by complex food webs of microbes that are moving it back and forth with plants. And uh, well, a lot of that becomes oxidized, yeah. Yeah, you know, some of it ends up in the water, but a lot of it just sort of goes up into the atmosphere and we end up having a lot of release into the atmosphere through those processes. We end up adding huge amounts of um, topsoil, former topsoil that becomes atmospheric CO2. And other forms of it go into other forms. If it's unindated, it might become anaerobic and it becomes methane. And some of it ends up in the bottom of the ocean as sediment. But over time, that carbon is eventually gonna get released and get dissolved either as ocean acidification or up into the atmosphere. So that history has been going on for a while in places like here, but also we have stories as old as Gilgamesh about the cutting down of the forests of Uruk, right? So we know, and followed by stories of great floods. So we know that this kind of damage to landscape um, has been going on for, for like a tremendously long time and it leaves deserts in its wake. So rivers, have also been channelized with flood control structures to protect homes and farmland. So often we settle in these uh, floodplains because they have incredible soils because the river has been delivering sediment to them over and over again, building soils, right? And uh, we wanna protect the farms and we wanna protect the landscape and we don't want large floods and we don't want that river to move to where people are. Um, 
And so one of the ways we do that is we channelize. Um, we put in flood control structures to protect them. And the result is that the holding capacity of the river itself is a lot more. We are in, we were adding to the river's ability to hold water without flooding. Um, in addition, changes in development and loss of organic matter in soils means water moves quicker on the land, filling these rivers quicker. So let's see what this picture is. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, I think this stuff is amazing. I could just go on to landscapes and look at river processes all day. So um, here's here's a little like, um, I don't even know what this is. This is a, a little graphic about the effects of imperviousness, the inability of land to hold water on runoff and infiltration. So natural ground cover absorbs everything. Some of it is evapotranspirated by trees. Some of it becomes runoff. And there's ways that we can improve that even. And there's uh, a lot of it gets infiltrated. But you put in some homes, you do low density residential, and now the runoff becomes 20%. And you do a medium density residential and it becomes 30% high density, and it's 60%, 59%. So that is a huge amount of water that is no longer slowly creeping through the land. You know, in places where it does not rain constantly, that is a buffering, right? So we have high events and low events, and the soil is just slowly transporting it, and it's going slowly from the soil down into the water table. And even the water table itself is just moving slowly through the landscape on its way down to where the closest river is and then it's slowly moving out. But when you don't have that infiltration, when it's all overland flow instead of infiltration, that water is now hitting the river all at once. And that means that you're having these flood events or these like high, high, um, you know, ha high, what am I trying to say? High, high water events that are happening simultaneously. The river's having to handle a lot of energy all at once. And normally it would move those things onto the floodplain. It would handle that energy or it would migrate the river in order to restructure itself to be able to handle the new hydrologic regime. But we are preventing that change from happening because we don't actually like all the excess floods. So upland changes cause flood changes, which we fight against, which adds more energy. And, you know, this has to give somewhere, right? So either there's catastrophic flood events that start happening as we're, like, accelerating this, this war against the water. Or that energy starts to cut. Because that river was balanced in its healthy state, right? It had the ability, the moment it had too much energy, it, the water moved up. But when that's gone, it just has enough energy now to start digging. Okay, what happens when... What happens when there's more water at once? It is allowed to stay in the channel. Well, it can do extra work with all that focused energy. So I'm going to introduce now the channel evolution model. So this is once that balance is changed, the river just starts digging until it hits rock, really. So in these class one rivers, sorry, the image is not that clear. You have a normal, non-modified, sinuous river. It has a good relationship with its floodplain. And then... It's been channelized. Maybe a large event allowed it to dig deeper. Maybe we've dug it deeper. Maybe we've changed the hydrologic regime in general and we've blocked the floodplain. So now it begins to degrade as much as it can. It goes deeper and deeper. And as it degrades, it also begins to widen. It grabs and eats at the side of the river, trying to balance itself right to the new level. And then as it starts going deep enough, eventually it carves out a new home for itself. Right, and maybe it's like a big wide channel. There's been so much erosion, it's moved all this material. Now you've got this big section, if possible. And so now it begins to do all these same processes again, just now meters deeper, right? So now it's building a new floodplain deeper on the landscape. It creates a quasi equilibrium, a new bankful. And you can find channelized streams where there's this sort of like zone this little like shelf of soil is starting to form and that's because the river has finally found its dynamic so it can start dropping material and start building a new bank for itself fortunately that can be so much deeper that it no longer has access to the surface and that river is never going to migrate again so this channel evolution from movement from class one all the way to this class six it actually happens from downstream to upstream. So when you walk along a river or stream, you can see this process in act. You can see at the bottom a channelized stream with its own floodplain that is in some sort of quasi-equilibrium. And as you walk up, you see a river that's hungry and eating at its banks and starting to like mix things up. You go a little higher and you see that it's just starting to drop and it's starting to draw from the sides. A little bit higher, 
you see the degradation beginning. And then there's this nick point, this spot where the river has transitioned from a healthy, balanced river, and it's beginning to do that collapse. And sometimes on really, um, on really difficult landscapes like high desert, where it doesn't take much moisture to move you from grassland to desert, you can literally see on the landscape a line where above the nick point, the larger landscape is in grassland and below the larger landscape is sagebrush or it's, you know, with large areas of dry landscape between. That transition of one ecoregion to another often is a matter of just a few inches of water, right? The ability to hold water a little longer. So the dropping of rivers represents the entire floodplain of the landscape dropping. And it also changes the processes that maintain, build vegetation and soil. So every river on the planet that we have set this process in is gonna keep dropping until it takes out the landscape with it. It's gonna keep moving uphill until it has balanced out all of that energy. So we've set a lot of things in motion that will take a long time to work themselves out. And we may lose a huge amount of the planet's topsoil in the process, even if we take on good practices, but don't actually start to address these processes. One of the cool things is we can actually go in here and we can begin to reverse these processes, right? If we slow the movement of water on the larger landscape, now there's less water in the floodplain and that process of you know dropping material of aggregation that happens in the increase so now you're starting to like all the stuff it's grabbing from upland it's now putting on the bottom and it's starting to build banks and it's moving itself higher and higher and the river begins to actually lift and that nick point begins to go downhill and the river can begin to become connected so if we can connect rivers to their floodplains then they have ability to access extra energy we can also dig new floodplains at the point that rivers already are at so that they don't go any deeper, which is like installing brakes on a bicycle that doesn't have one. So we can, we can add these brakes. And one of the ways of doing that is through technical means, you can actually carve out a new floodplain. There's these machines that we drive over the river during um, non-salmon season, and they can help crush the floodplain back into some sort of alignment. And in a lot of landscapes, this is also re-regulated by huge herds of hoofed mammals where you have, you know, thousands of wildebeest or bison coming through a landscape once a season or every few years. And they, they push the landscape back into that alignment and make sure that there aren't any um, incisions happening. And then the river can access the floodplain, drop materials and build back um, a larger relationship with the landscape. And the floodplain can also like restabilize and start to lift on the landscape so that more of the land can hold water and can act like a better water storage sponge. Oh, cool. Yeah. Isn't this, isn't this stuff fascinating? I just think it's this so interesting. And it's uh, learning this stuff really changed the way I see ecology and see landscapes. Um, and also see like the way that we can make small interventions on land and have large scale um, downstream processes and upstream processes. Yeah, I know they... They're fascinating. Um, in the wrong place, they just mess rivers up, but in the right timing, if they have, if, if they don't come often, if they come infrequently, but in huge numbers, they can do wonders to landscapes. Something we should practice. Because otherwise we have to do it ourselves with machinery and honestly, we don't have enough machinery. So here's another image of the channel evolution model. A nice stable waterway with a high terrace, but a floodplain that regulates the river and the river's relationship to the floodplain is steady over time, maybe with small movements, small migrations. And also every landscape has its own patterns and its own seasonality and its own issues. So there isn't one kind of river that's right. Some river systems are so close to the surface and they maintain braided networks that are sort of weaving their ways over time. And that's the balance that they've found. And also beavers and those kinds of organisms are doing an incredible job. Like beavers are just basically going to landscapes and they're like lifting rivers. They're building, they're taking rivers and they're modifying them so that they hold water as high as possible. They're allowing rivers to settle and drop sediment and they're creating wide landscapes of braided streams. Um, in Oregon, where I'm from, uh, we now have this central one channel river of the Willamette. But, um, you know, not that long ago, just a couple hundred years ago, the Willamette Valley was many, many braided streams all interlocking with each other. Um, and beavers were maintaining a lot of that system. And uh, we got to remember, like, that's the work of a healthy landscape. 
And this work is also happening in places like uh, Northern and Western Europe where they're reintroducing beavers um, simply because they don't have these kinds of landscape processes in effect. And without, without organisms that are maintaining and modifying these landscapes, um, eventually these degradation processes happen on their own and we end up on, you know, basically Mars. So here's that channel. It's digging too deep because there's too much water. A cut has happened. You can even imagine these as cuts on the same river as you go down slope. It's widening. Eventually that material is starting to like redeposit. And then the new floodplain flows lower. And the difference here is that you have this little green zone in a deserty or drier environment. Well, before you maybe had green all the way around. So if it's ever stopped by rock, it will carve into banks and form a new lower floodplain and stabilize, maybe. But as it is the drain of the watershed, the water table of the entire landscape flows down. Groundwater will flow towards incised streams and parallel to unincised streams, right? Because when a river's not incised, the water is actually, the river is actually all the way into the floodplain in the ground and it's moving down the channel. Some of it does never makes it down into the river, right? It's all moving very slowly, but it's moving through the soil of the floodplain. But if you have an incised river, you've created a balance change. And so now the water's converging. And so it's again, a concentration of energy. Channel incision will lower the water table levels in floodplains. Water tables will dip steeply towards incised stream channels. Less recharge of the water table will occur in incised stream floodplain following precipitation events. So an incised river, whether you can tell that it's incised or not, is actually a drain on the landscape as opposed to a balanced river, which is maintaining all of these things and gently moving water as it releases gravity and does its work on soil and biological processes. Um, so this terrifies me, to be frank. This actually terrifies me. I'm, I'm more scared of these processes as, as drivers of future climate change and of changes in our ability to have like healthy ecosystems and landscapes. These are runaway processes and they can be reversed. And the, the tools of river restoration um, effectively are able to change the energy balance, redirect energy, restructure rivers, rebuild rivers. And there's been a huge movement where engineers of rivers have moved from just being like, we're going to build this channel, uh, we're going to fight the flood, to being like, well, how do we actually work with all of the balances? And for a while, they were doing things like putting tree roots out of the soil and engineering them so that the tree roots would grab the water and slow it down the way it happens in natural rivers. And then they got obsessed with the idea that you could make log jams because log jams in rivers that fill up rivers have the ability to like stay put and move slowly down the river. And they're holding water and they're allowing deposition and they're like taking energy that normally tries to eat the banks. So if you give the river something to chew on, right, it can, it can actually do, it, it's hungry and it starts dropping its extra sediment. Here's an example of channel evolution. Yeah. Yeah, those big river systems and all the rivers off of the Mississippi. Um, you, we have to, the thing about river restoration and landscape restoration is you can do it through restructuring the channel, but you really have to do it at, at all the headwaters. So it's really the, it's the continental divide and down. And we have to be doing it all these different places. And uh, it's the entire Midwest. And so changing soil permeability, change, you know, uh, all the erosion, events like the Dust Bowl in those places, like those actually are changing the larger dynamics of the river all the way down to its mouth. And again, they are fixable, but they have to be prioritized, right? We need to be prioritizing this kind of thing. Yeah. The Mississippi is like half the continent. And so that is like, you're all linked to each other. All of you on the other side of the continental divide for me, like you're linked and your fates are connected because as one drops and others drop, like you're going to be having Grand Canyons forming eventually. So here's examples of channel evolution from South Dakota. Here's a stage one. Look at that river. It is just the little peaking surface of the larger landscape. And here is a stage two is it starts to take energy and it's grabbing from the sides. Here's a stage three river. 
And here's stage four where it's actually forming a new floodplain lower. This is a new balance, but it's a balance where this water is constantly draining off the landscape as it sort of pools in this large in this lower floodplain. Yep. Yeah, it's the expression of energy, right? This is what this is uh, all of this is the expression of solar energy as it faces geologic processes, right? So elevation is made by earth processes building mountains. That sort of like gets used up by erosion, but it's the water that the sun is lifting that's being dropped and it's the release of that solar energy that is causing all of that erosion. And life has figured out how to optimize those those uh, storages and improve the storages of water in order to you know, carve out um, something pretty amazing on this rock. Nope, this keeps happening. I don't wanna look at the news right now. Again, thank you everybody who's here. I'm really appreciating having uh, the community here to talk with. So I think you guys can see why this is like an important topic that's close to my heart. That's cool, Joel. If uh, in, if anybody wants to see in the chat, Joel has just put a, a map up of the Mississippi Basin. It's a lot more fun than talking with Joe Rogan. Uh, agreed. Is that what I pulled up? I wasn't even paying attention to the... Okay, I want to get this right. So many landscapes around us are out of balance. Rivers and streams ready to carve into the earth and change uh, the large landscape into... Oh, I want to put this so that it's less news, more image. I'm glad uh, Twitter started using this option. So many landscapes around us are out of balance. Rivers and streams ready to carve into the earth and change the large landscape into something with a lot less water. Grasslands into desert, wet forests into drier. There is a lot of soil carbon at stake. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, we have all these trees that are starting to not have deep enough roots into water. The water tables are dropping and we're losing our red cedars and we're losing a lot of our like, you know, local conifers that are just get stressed out, not having the right water balance. Oh, so here is um, looking at soil carbon on the planet. And you can see that plants take in carbon through photosynthesis. And then they respirate some of it, about half. A lot of it eventually gets stored as plant biomass. And the plants feed the microbes in the soil. And over time, the soil takes on more and more and stores those microbes when it can. And so the fossil pool, fossil pool of carbon is 10,000 units. This is gigatons, I think, gigatons per year. The soil is 23,000, so that's like, you know, it's a little smaller, but it's actually much more easy and much quicker process. And the net terrestrial uptake is three in relationship to that. So here's our soil carbon. Well, what happens if we allow incision to take out topsoils. Well, I've done a back of napkin estimate a while back uh, for what the current top foot of soil carbon would mean if we added it to the atmosphere. Now, I'm not saying that this is like uniformly gonna happen, but if we took uh, what is regarded as the top foot of topsoil off the planet, and this is like what's down, like every river system that's dropping is like got this in the way, um, it roughly brings the Earth's levels of CO2 to 1200 parts per million. Um, and incision is a runaway process that will continue if we don't take responsibility for it. So I, I'm, you know, I'm not a climate modeler, but like, I just keep noticing that like, we're, there's a lot of carbon <laughs> that's like in the way. And that could literally just be like removed and is like, we're, you know, every year we lose so much topsoil we're, we've lost half the topsoil of like the country, I believe since the 1960s. And this is like continuing. So. I don't want us. I mean, I don't. I don't think 12, 1200 ppm is uh, survivable for humans. That's like wet bulb temperatures that most most of us won't be able to handle. Um, so we actually have a lot of ways of dealing with it, and they include changing the water storage ability of the uplands part of the landscape through ponds, permeable surfaces, swales, soil, vegetation. 
we can change our land use and help balance the river system. So one a good example are the pond systems that uh, P.A. Yeomans designed in the 50s and 60s in Australia, which are maximizing pond storage high on the landscape, well above the rivers, and collect all of the extra overland flow that normally goes into the rivers, and allowing it to get held in ponds that then get spread out during the dry season. And this allows all of the water eventually to get infiltrated. A little bit gets uh, evaporated because of the ponds, but not, en not enough in this equation. And the water then, as it gets infiltrated throughout the year, becomes a steady flow of water that keeps the river going and keeps it at the right balance. Um, and we don't get any of those larger events. In a lot of ways, this actually stabilizes water systems and brings energy out of it, which allows them to begin to do those deposition processes and build up their own banks and create better landscape relationships. No. Oh. Joel says that aquifer drop plus the soil blowing off has made a drop of 10 feet in some places. Yeah, you can see images from like the American West where, you know, I was driving in California in 2016 and I kept noticing buildings and fence posts on tufts of ground like that high above everywhere else. And a lot of them were new structures. And I was driving with my partner at the time and she was looking at the beautiful landscape and I was like, I don't think this is a good situation. I think that the soil is coming out from under this, this landscape because that's like... That's a new house and it's on top of, you know, a foot of a foot tuft of, on its surrounding landscape. So like that's like a lot of soil that's being lost during the 2016 droughts and like before in California. And they've also changed their water system so much in order to manage the aquifer for large populations and um, the massive agriculture of like the Central Valley and the Sacramento region. So we can artificially shape new floodplains. Uh, we can go in there and we can carve out new floodplains and we can change the sinuosity of rivers in places. So in places where we actually, a river, it's unacceptable. There's a human community, there's like structures, there's things we can't have the river move. We can, we can actually design river sinuosity so that it's in balance at a new hydrologic regime and that the river will not have um, any impetus to be moving. So it'll be a stable channel rather than a moving channel. There's like a bazillion kinds of rivers. And so we can, we can uh, tweak the sinuosity of a river so that it, it it's healthy but it's not a, a migrating channel um, we can connect rivers to oxbows and old channels that are curvier so here's in iowa a handbook on oxbow restoration where they are literally linking rivers back to their old oxbows so here's a river and here's a former path that that river once took that is slowly becoming just normal landscape but you can see the that this river used to be over here and they're just carving it out so that the river now has this back channel and this can be incredible habitat you know this is like a little pool pond that's connected to the river so fish can rear in there it can be refugia um, these can be lovely little spots that the water is able to occupy and fill and depending on how it's designed either they're permanent or during high rain events the river can backflow into these side channels and there's a huge amount of loss. So what do they say here? Oxbow features are remnant meanders of rivers and creeks cut off from the main channel, either by erosive forces or human alteration. When these features are restored and reconnected to the watercourse as a meander, they provide habitat for fish, birds, reptiles, amphibians that prefer slower moving water, provide flood storage capacity, reduce sediment load, and can reduce nitrate loads by 56%. Restorations are low cost, often costing less than $10,000 and land, uh, Retirement is typically not required because they're often found in marginal silted in areas. So these are already not very favored spots. Uh, they say silted in, but I can also tell you that as a former riverbed, it's possible that it's also got rocks down a couple feet. So it's not your ideal um, spot for, for farming. So we can put up structures made of rock, wood, and living plants that help the stream. These are great for emergencies as well as contexts that are hard to introduce beavers to, right? So there's places that are like, you just can't put beavers. And so we can, we can be adding our own sort of artificial beaver systems um, in those places. Other places we should just add beavers because they're way easier. So here's a dam made of wattle fences. Often these are living fences, so they're, they're willows. And those dams are able to slow the water because it's a, a wattle, meaning like woven fence and it's living material sometimes, water still flows through it. Um, it could be done so that it's on the sides, so that it slows down the river as it gets a little higher. 
but these allow backfill of sediment. Over time, sediment drops and the channel actually goes up over time. It's pretty sweet. So here's some natural beaver dams, right? A beaver finds a, a, a river. The trench is starting to widen, but the beavers go in there and they start to block it off. And they raise the water behind it and they keep raising it and the river gets farther and farther away and they dig side channels. And eventually you've got this like landscape of ponds and braided streams and habitat and beaver dams. And the whole landscape is uh, wet and alive. You know, I just found out that there is there's a lot of people who who remove beavers from their properties, unfortunately, in Oregon and Washington. And uh, I just found out that the uh, the uh, the local like fish and wildlife they have an entire zone of forest that needs beavers, and so they just move them into all of the tributaries. And there's basically this like gigantic uh, retirement community, like community of beavers, where they just keep moving and growing the beaver population and creating like a whole zone that's just like beaver cities. And uh, their hope is that eventually, like, the, pr the population pressure is going to get higher and they can start moving those beavers for restoration in other places as people get more favorable. So we can do the same thing where we're not able to have beavers or where beavers are, are having difficulty. And beavers like these landscapes, too, so eventually they can be introduced. But we can also do that work. We can stop widening. We can build our own structures. And we can have the same kinds of effects. And we can do hybrids too, where we're doing some of the work and beavers are doing other parts of the work. Recovery sequence for incision prone alluvial streams comparing natural beaver activity to beaver analogs. Uh, BDAs with, uh, which is the beaver analog, uh, BDAs withstand greater stream power than many natural dams. Uh, BDAs can be strategically placed to maximize widening or uh, aggradation to enhance the rate of recovery and provide benefits to aquatic and riparian habit during recovery. So we raise the river over time, we widen it, we create, we reconnect to the floodplain, and eventually we raise the water tables and we move that incision downstream so that the landscape can, can start to recover and we can protect our soils. Large high density wood de debris to initiate process-based and stream recovery. Pine Creek Watershed Scoping Plan. Okay, that's what these are from, these images. Um, so that beaver idea is not a joke. I mean, I've already talked about it with you guys, so you know it's not a joke. I'm having trouble. I think my computer's starting to have some freezing problems. Oh, oh. That is not what I wanted. I don't know why Disneyland is starting to post on my thing. Give me a second. We'll get back to this. I think I gotta figure out how to speed up this computer while I'm doing streaming. Sometimes it seems like it gets a little stressed out by all these images. We're almost done here. So, thanks for uh, sticking with me while I go off on this. So, that beaver idea is not a joke. We can restore so much of this by introducing beavers. We, uh, who know how to slow water, improve infiltration, raise water tables. It's not going to work everywhere, but everywhere it can, it makes a difference. The, the Beaver Restoration Handbook was written by one of my mentors, Dr. Janine Castro, and it is an incredible discussion about how, the how-to of reintroducing beavers to all sorts of communities. And uh, here's a nice picture of a beaver dam holding back water, raising water levels, taking energy out of the system, starting that process of raising the banks, reconnecting floodplains, rebuilding the landscape. I also highly recommend the work of Occidental Arts and Ecology Center in campaigning and advocating for beaver reintroduction in California. Their Be Bring Back the Beaver campaign has uh, successfully made the scientific case that beavers are native species to California, which for a long time, um, agricultural pressure was trying to insist that beaver pelts that were found in California were um, human brought from Washington and Oregon during the, the beaver, the, the pelt trade, the fur trade. And uh, they were making the claim that beavers were not a natural part of the ecosystem. But now that case has been made and beaver uh, introduction is fast, uh, is, is becoming a big deal in California, which is necessary for repairing those landscapes. 
Um, this would go so much quicker and smoother if we just empowered those who have thousands of years of cultural history, and that includes beavers and fishery. So empowering indigenous people um, and native folks in ownership, policy, and co-management means that we don't have to reinvent how to do this. They already have uh, consistent and intact traditions on how to manage and maintain these landscapes. Um, so it's always better to go for the people who actually have been taking care of this landscape for so long and understand culturally as well as technologically how to do it. Um, so I'm going to just say one more thing that might turn off some people, but that's the process of floodplain connection was maintained by one other force, lar one large hoofed ma mammals. And so all over the world, this happens every now and then. Herds of large hoofed mammals come through and trample the edge and do the exact same thing that technologically we do with what's called a sheep's foot roller. A sheep's foot roller is a big metal tube with fake sheep's feet metal that a machine rolls across the landscape in order to get the same kind of hoof pushing action. And it, we use it sometimes in order to build new floodplains and stabilize them and grab the material so that there's a, nice steps from the water to bank full to floodplain make the landscape connect a little bit quicker so we can also be just doing this with hoofed mammals that includes proper and i'm saying proper management of cattle cattle out of the stream most of the time but at certain times of the year a planned heavy intervention of large hoofed mammals can make a huge difference in the health of streams this needs to be done extremely consciously Here's another stock photo of caribou doing the same thing, walking through streams, trampling. These aren't great pictures for this. You can see pictures of wildebeest just like completely compacting and changing the edges of rivers. Uh, so this makes sense. If the disturbance is big but infrequent, it can keep the system cor corrected and balanced. In fact, when making new floodplains, river restoration technology uses compactors like these sheep's foot rollers. Actually, see all these like the equivalent of hooves, and it rolls over in order to build a new floodplain when we're trying to give the river something breaks that it can like access. Holistic management says that if herds of grazers are mostly kept out of streams but used strategically, they can help allow for seed establishment rebuild floodplain connections which is not the same as letting cows stay in the stream all the time um this plugs into all the other things i write about from regenerative agriculture coppice agroforestry urban water catchment staying out of the floodplains key line design these all help water stay longer on hills they stop erosion they help the land river system find balance and can even make new springs and lift rivers on the landscape the threat is huge and restoring rivers has to be part of any Green New Deal. We need to clean this up now or else the land will drain and desertify all over the planet. Um, and I'm gonna end this video, this whole thing with a video from Ben Falk, his swale and pond system
here's elk crossing. Oh, this is the problem is as soon as I try to click on things, it changes the window. Nope. My apologies. Joel says restore all the springs. That's right. And we really can. Well, we don't have to watch that. So like I said earlier, where we can use Beaver, we should. And where we can't, there's equivalent things we can do. And I recommend watching all the different documentaries and ideas about Beaver. So I think um, I think that that's, that's where I'm going to stop on this. So, you know, to, to look back, what we did is we talked about the energy storage that water represents on landscapes. And we talked about the way that water moves on landscape as it starts to move from the uplands down into floodplains, down into the water table. And when there's a balanced river, there's a good relationship between land and water. And when that balance changes, the water is drained by the river. And at the same time, the soil begins to go with it and the climate conditions become drier and drier. So we really need to be aware of these processes because they're in front of us. Um, every river that's begun to incise will continue to incise. Every river that's been channelized will continue to uh, dig down deeper. And all of these effects are co compounding and growing over time. Um, if we do not put a huge amount of our energy towards river restoration and understanding and reconnecting rivers to floodplains, we're going to be facing compounding problems that are part of climate change that tend to not be part of the regular discussion. I believe personally that something like a Green New Deal or like a large societal effort for the restoration of landscapes uh, for addressing climate change, we, I would put most of our resources towards fixing rivers first because that changes balances up and down slope and up and down river valleys. So we need to be uh, putting critical attention to those issues. And then that opens the door for all sorts of other uh, options and opportunities. You know, if we're a little moister as climate change is happening, we will have so many more options, you know, oases rather than deserts, grasslands rather than deserts, uh, uh, the next level of forest before that. And also with healthy forests comes less forest fire and all of those issues. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to even accelerate these processes. And we could be building soil and improving landscapes simply by using rivers as an opportunity to, to build back fecundity and moisture and capacity to like our regions, our communities, our culture, our planet. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions for a few minutes. If anybody has anything that they'd like to add or say, uh, this is the time for that discussion. Um, but otherwise, I'm really grateful that everybody's here with me and um, having this conversation. There are quite a few people here. Thank you, everybody who's here. If you haven't already, please um, follow and uh, I think after today we'll be able to be an affiliate and we'll actually be able to have subscriptions if people want to help donate. Did this thread have the Tucson swales? No, I didn't talk about the Tucson swales at all. Um, we can talk about them at some point. I'm, that might be a whole discussion, but, but basically during the uh, after the Dust Bowl, we lost so much soil that uh, the efforts to combat the Dust Bowl and also the Great Depression put a lot of people to work on the landscape in the in the original New Deal. And uh, one of those efforts was they got hydrologic engineers to go and build gigantic swales to stop erosion. And they're so well designed, they're very stable, that you can go down to places like Tucson and off the side of the road are enormous swales that you can walk into. And the cool thing about them is even though the larger landscape is still having some of the same problems of being dry and you know, moving out of even what's supporting the former Sonoran ecology. Um, in those swales, you have, you know, God, how many years has it been now since the 30s? So 90 years of ongoing collection of moisture over time, plants that are growing over time, and um, really a, a much like wider ecology showing the capacity of that place. Um, and they just keep going. You build a swale like that and it'll last for a couple hundred years and keep doing the work. And even when it's done being a swale, it's backfilled with so much soil and it's holding so much moisture that the landscape itself is transformed into a sponge that does all the same kind of work that a swale would have done 200 years earlier. 
So do these processes pertain to, or do you have any resources that pertain to the Mississippi basin? The certification may be far off, but we are um, hemorrhaging marshlands at an alarming rate, which of course makes storms worse and feeds back into more soil loss. Well, you know, every time there's a gigantic, um, like event that happens in the Midwest, the the transition of that landscape, the the spraying of fertilizer salts has absolutely changed the organic matter levels of the soil, right? So we almost have no topsoil in the Mississippi basin at this point. And it's just subsoil that keeps getting refertilized with soluble fertilizers, which go into the groundwater. 80% of fertilizer application like that leaves the system just through water. So you already have this sort of salted earth thing happening, right? Where we're keeping things alive because those salts happen to be plant nutrients, um, but we're destroying the, the water underneath. And every time there's one of those big events, you hear like governors and you hear the Department of Agriculture and they have little press releases where they talk about the loss of, you know, half a foot, a foot of soil during those events. And you go to places like Indiana, Iowa, and you see that the water is just like taken away the topsoil again. There's nothing holding it in place. Um, so these processes happen every river system. This is just literally how river dynamics work. Um, I would argue that one way of thinking about desertification as opposed to deserts, and this gets complicated, right? Because there are natural deserts that are extremely healthy ecosystems. And then there are places that have um, fallen apart and become dry. And we also call those deserts. So no desert dissing about healthy deserts but unhealthy deserts could be viewed as a problem with the balance of evaporation or water retention and water holding, right? So if you can hold water in a landscape, there's water. So if you even have a dry place, but there's lots of organic matter, there's like, you go to the Sonoran Desert in the healthy spots and there's all these tree layers and you go under that, it's pretty lush. You know, there's not much rain in the system, but it's recycled over and over again by the, the biology. Um, but the moment you take away some of that biology, evaporation outbalances storage. Well, in the same way, you can look at landscapes that are literally moving all of their water off-site, right? They get plenty, maybe they even get plenty of rain, but there's no effective storage of rain in the landscape over time. So as we're increasing the rate at which water is flowing out of the water table and into river systems, and we're, and it's causing downhill, downstream flooding, which we're barricading against, which is moving that water quicker and quicker off the landscape, we are building a landscape that is draining water. And so I would argue that it, that is that is effective desertification. Um, even though you may have rain falling from the sky, there's nothing holding it in place. And it's taking the, the soil with it. So from everything I've seen, all the times I've visited the Midwest, um, absolutely the same the same processes. As for resources, you know, I know my regions really well, but there's a ton of resources and the, the global world of river restoration is huge. And there are big efforts in the Great Lakes. There's big efforts in the Mississippi Basin. I don't know if I can think of any uh, organizations off the top of my head. Um, I also know that the financial incentives are a little different. In the Midwest, the incentives happen to be like things like flood control and agriculture. Well, here a lot of the incentives have been historically salmon. Uh, which means that we have a little bit more pressure for designing systems that actually facilitate salmon habitat. Not always successfully, but there's still that like the main money flow has been the design for salmon. Oh, Joel says, I'm also feeding into the draining of the largest aquifer in the Midwest, which is no longer recharging faster than it's being pumped, right? So we're, we're losing our aquifers, we're losing our groundwater. That's really the issue here. So again, just like degradation, Erosion is the opposite of flooding. There, there's this balance that happens. Land processes are this regulation of that balance. I think you should also be thinking about things like groundwater recharge, those deep aquifers that take millennia to recharge, you know, as we pump them out and try to use them. If our landscape is holding water, we don't have to be uh, digging deeper and deeper wells in order to irrigate, right? So I think these things are all, all at play. I wish I was better informed about that region. Of course, my like specialty is going to be the places that I visit regularly. Um, I'll keep my eye out for opportunities and, and uh, resources and keep putting them out. And um, please let me know if you find anything that like pertains really well. Uh, Europe has been starting to recover a lot of this because they literally have been living in landscapes that have been so degraded for so long that there's very little memory 
of even what the plant communities or the structures of rivers are like. And it often has taken them a lot of, a lot of like making the case to society, to their societies that this is something good. And in a lot of ways, places like where they're reintroducing beaver, it's as if they're creating wildlands or rewilding in a place that nobody has any memory of it being wild to begin with. Um, so it's interesting when I used to go to, I don't do this much anymore, but when I used to go to river conferences, um, it was often a lot of Europeans that were there talking with people from the Pacific Northwest saying, we want our landscape to look like the places that you're right now, like losing or trying to maintain. Um, but we need to be able to study those places and make the case for it. Joel says that the WRP, can you uh, tell me what the acronym stands for? Is a reasonable tax loop for people with land to do restoration and get help, but you have to get land. You have to be landed to get it. You know, there's actually a lot of uh, NRCS uh, and Department of Agriculture, Wetlands Restoration Program, that's right. Um, and I'm actually really curious what the current status of the Wetlands Act was. The Wetlands Act was from the early 70s and it required the at least, at least direct replacement of all lost wetlands, which is like its own issue. But I know that Trump uh, effectively like halted wetlands law as we know it. And so it's it's gone to the states and some states have better, worse wetlands rules. Um, I don't know if it's been restored. I'd really like to see, actually. I don't think a Green New Deal or like climate action can happen without a restoration of wetlands protection. Um, but it's always possible to look and see best practices for, for land managers. It's also possible for cities to do this. Cities are daylighting streams. Cities are rebuilding channels. Uh, maybe sometime I'll post some stuff on how you can, how cities are making parks that have better channeled streams. There's tons here where they've taken what was before just like a ditch and turned it into an actual habitat space where extra water is able to move onto an artificially built floodplain and no longer causes flood flooding downhill in neighborhoods and communities because they've actually said, okay, we're gonna allocate a park to be a flood control structure and we can do that. Or up, upstream here, we're gonna add beavers or here we're going to do projects with a lot of like wetlands control. Here in Portland, and this idea has spread to other cities since, we actually have taken the sides of roads and built artificial wetlands right off of the sidewalks where stormwater goes right in soaks fills up there's all this wetlands vegetation and trees and um, rushes and cat and cattails and all sorts of stuff and then it slowly flows back into the stormwater system so we can even be doing sort of like things like that where we build like container wetlands all over the place things like green roofs things like swales things like building better soil in our yards or depaving landscapes from concrete and, and um, impervious materials all those things contribute right and also developing our landscapes really well so that we're holding water i think one thing to remember is that the way that we currently design farms and cities is we we see water as a as a potential problem and so we move it off site as quick as possible either into detention or retention in most housing but usually we try to build stormwater systems or we build tiles under farms in order to move the water out of the landscape and so we effectively create deserts and then we have to go search for water. We have to search for irrigation. We have to search for um, wells or watersheds to grab water to be able to grow our lawns or even our gardens. So um, we drain all water off so that we can have a dry starting place to bring water in. And that's ridiculous. We could be designing in ways that help hold water as high as possible while still having the benefits of maybe um, making sure that the water isn't waterlogged in basements or in gardens or in parks, that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of design approaches for that and we can always talk about those things sometime in the future. Um, I think I'm gonna wrap up in a second. Um, any last questions or thoughts before, before we end? I just realized you can't see the, um, can't see the comments the way I have the window set up. Okay. Next time I uh, talk, I'll make sure that the comments are always visible. All right, everybody, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, you've, you've put a lot of energy into just listening and, and taking this on. So what I recommend is that from here on, when you walk around the landscape, watch where water goes. Think about that it's a storage of solar energy and maybe even take a walk following its route as it goes from wherever you are, the top of your roof or 
along the street and think about where it goes and where the, where it enters into a river or where it permeates into soil in your landscape. And maybe you can think about that as being um, a relationship that you currently have um, with this process. All right. Thank you very much. Hope everybody has a really nice evening. Yeah. Thank you too. Now I'm new to this. I don't know uh, who to raid. <laughs> So if anybody has any suggestions of like a good ethical streamer um, to recommend, I, I accept I accept recommendations. I'll give the opportunity. I'm trying to be good about Twitch. So if anybody if anybody wants to like recommend somebody that always could use a little bit of a boost, I'm happy to happy to offer that. All right, nobody's recommending anything. I'll get to know some other streamers and we can recommend people. Have a great after or evening, everybody.